Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this episode of Transwestern Talks, our webinar series. Today, we welcome Jimmy Hinton, Senior Managing Director, Investment and Analytics, and Steve Pomper, Executive Managing Partner, Capital Markets, who will explore the data and trends that hint at when and how a recovery will take shape. We will take Q&A after the presentation, so be sure to ask your questions in the Q&A section of the chat. Jimmy, Steve. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the call. This is the uh, third call in a series that we've been hosting over the past six weeks, and uh, we thank you for your interest and for coming back. Over the next uh, half hour to 45 minutes, we're going to be giving you some uh, updates as we've been seeing them come through the data that we track as we try to figure out uh, where the impacts are taking place and how that may play out in the commercial real estate markets in which we all participate. Uh, I'm going to start with a uh, overview of some employment trends and some updates that we're seeing as we get a little bit more finite in the scope of geographies that we're able to uh, get a perspective towards. Then I'm going to move into um, <clears throat> some economic trends and how we see that out, how we see it playing out in the economy, and then move into specific uh, property types valuations, changes in supply and demand, and the outlook. And then I'm going to hand it to Steve Pumper, who's going to help us uh, by covering the capital markets, which, as you can imagine, are pretty robust at the moment in terms of the volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace. So with that, we're going to start uh, where we have in the past, which is with unemployment claims. And by now, we're all very familiar with the term flattening the curve, and we're starting to see that in the unemployment market. Uh, as measured by the number of people that are letting the government know that they've lost their jobs. We've been tracking unemployment claims for insurance, both people that are filing initial claims for the first time and those that report to the government that they remain in an unemployed fashion for a long time. The country's been focusing on this uh, track record for about 50 years, and that's represented by the orange line in the graph on the left-hand side. When we add uh, seven data points, or uh, eight data points rather, to, to this data set, the orange line gets compressed really dramatically. And we see that a 50 standard, standard deviation event uh, has resulted in about 30 million people filing for the first time for unemployment benefits this cycle. It's been really important to see a protracted decline in this number uh, as it gets reported by the Department of Labor every Thursday. And what we're going to start doing going forward is paying attention not only to the people that are filing an initial claim for unemployment benefit, but starting to focus on the number of people that are remaining unemployed because the conversation is shifting from how many people have lost their job to how many people are going to come back into the workforce once economies around the country start to reopen. And obviously, the more transient job losses are going to be beneficial to real estate, whereas the more permanent ones uh, are going to be worse off. So it's interesting to look at these numbers from a national perspective, but it becomes a little bit more relevant to all of us uh, as we start to focus on these figures in a, in a more finite geography. And let's start by looking at the states. The easiest way to measure the pain in each state is to think about the number of people that have filed for an unemployment claim since the uh, beginning of the pandemic started relative to the number of people that were employed prior to the pandemic. And we've provided that analysis here. As an example, a state like Utah or the District of Columbia, which is in the lower left-hand part of the graph that you see here on page four, I'm circling it with my mouse, a relatively small number of people in each of those locales has filed for an unemployment claim, less than 250,000 in both the state of Utah and in the District of Columbia. And when we take that measure and we divide it into the total number of employees, a relatively small percentage of the workforce in those places uh, has lost their job. Conversely, in a state like Georgia, we've seen a very high number of people report to the government that they've lost their job, and that represents a very high percentage of the total labor force. And so when we look at the information in this context, it's not all that surprising to see local politicians in Georgia, in Kentucky, in Pennsylvania and Michigan face a lot of pressure politically and otherwise to try to reopen their economy as fast as possible. When we look at data, we see that roughly 22% of 
employees in the United States have filed for an unemployment claim. And that's reflected by this dotted line here. So you can look at the state in which you live or the states where you have commercial real estate exposure, and you can figure out how your state is performing on a relative basis. The largest states in the United States are out here to the right hand side. And their problem isn't so much that they have a high percentage of employment. Their problem is that they have a high number of people that are filing for unemployment claims. And when you think about trying to replace millions of jobs at a time, it takes a long time to do that, even when the market is good. So we're going to continue to focus on this information, but just an immediate takeaway would be markets that have a relatively low amount of disruption to the local labor force are probably going to be the markets that outperform from a commercial real estate property fundamental standpoint going forward. And as with the data, as with the data, as I presented on a national level, it's not that helpful to understanding what's going on on the ground in a specific location. And the same is true at the state level. So what we've tried to do in the next slide is to give you a feel for what we're seeing at the zip code level. Using Census Bureau information and combining it with some uh, data from the Internal Revenue Service, what we've started to map is modeled unemployment at the zip code level relative to the average income in that zip code reported to the Internal Revenue Service. And we see some really interesting trends here. This is a kind of a technical graph, but the takeaway is that if you live in a zip code where the average reported income is less than $50,000 a year, your unemployment rate is twice as likely to be above the national average. And I've got some blue dots here and some green dots. I wanted to highlight a particular state. The green dots on this page reflect all the zip codes within Georgia. And it's not all that surprising to see that some zip codes are above the 40% statewide average for unemployment. And some of these zip codes are significantly less than the average. But what is interesting to see is that Georgia acts a lot like the rest of the country. As the average reported income in a zip code gets higher, the propensity for it to report lower unemployment on a relative basis improves. So many investors will be trying to figure out where do I want to make an investment in the real estate market as it starts to recover from the, the disruption caused by the pandemic? Or conversely, where do I see risk within my existing portfolio? Looking at this type of data is really important to answering some of those types of questions. One other nuance is that income distribution um, provided by the CARES Act and state unemployment benefits is pretty uneven. So let's take a look at that at the state level as we get into economic trends. This is an analysis of the average income earner in every state. And this analysis comes to us from CoStar, which did a really good job with this analysis. Thinking about the state benefit that's provided to someone who's unemployed and, and also combining that state benefit with the $600 extra weekly income that the CARES Act provides, lower cost of living states have been by far and away the outsized beneficiary. The big reason for that is because average incomes in lower cost of living states are lower than they are in higher cost of living states. Just thinking about the average wage earner in a state like Oregon, the state benefit combined with the federal benefit means that someone who's lost their job may actually have as much as 20% higher disposable income as a result of the unemployment benefit that they're collecting. Whereas in a state like New York City or California or DC where the market is a little bit more expensive, they have not been able to completely replace their income if they're earning an average wage. This is an important uh, consideration, you know, given that the majority of the US gross domestic product is generated by personal consumption. And what we're all hoping is for a V-shaped recovery, which is going to be uh, driven by a recovery in consumer spending. What you might expect is that retail spending in markets like this is gonna uh, snap back more quickly than it will in some of the states that are represented on the right-hand side of the page. What do I mean by a snapback in consumer spending? Well, let's look at second quarter GDP that was reported by the Bureau of Economic Analysis a couple of weeks ago. Looking at uh, about a 30, uh, excuse me, a 20 year track record of GDP growth on a quarterly basis, we see that personal consumption, which is the orange bar in every quarter here, has never really shrunk. There's a couple of instances of it shrinking in an individual quarter during the financial crisis, 
but it was relatively small. The majority of the decline in GDP at a national level was driven more by businesses not investing or government not responding um, you know, very, very quickly or for a long period of time in the wake of a crisis. What we see in the first quarter of 2020 is a contraction in, GP, in GDP that feels similar to 2009 on a nominal basis. You see here that GDP declined by 4.8% in the first quarter, and it declined by 4.4% in the first quarter of 2009, but the composition is entirely different. Businesses are shut down and consumers have a hard time spending. So we saw a very, very big decline in consumer spending. This is a very elastic category in terms of its ability to recover. When economies start to reopen, what many hope is that the consumer will go out and spend money. We hear a lot of politicians and economists talking about pent up demand. That's gonna be heavily dependent on the idea that they feel safe going out and spending their money. Uh, but what that means is that it's very difficult for consumer dependent companies to predict their future. And so what we've seen in the S&P 500 is that consumer dependent companies are pulling their forward guidance of the amount of money that they expect to make in the second and third quarter. And if you look at it by category, consumer discretionary companies, uh, more than half of them have pulled their guidance altogether. And you see that uh, consumer staples uh, and other businesses have seen a very dramatic decrease in their ability to predict their future. Um, what that means is that we've got a very complicated outlook. And while early on during the pandemic, many people were hopeful of a V-shaped recovery, that now actually looks less probable. RCL Co. in Southern California recently conducted a fantastic study of commercial real estate investors. And of their respondents, about 10% were envisioning a V-shaped recovery. About 64% were projecting a U-shaped recovery. And when I think about the wide U curve at the top of the screen here and the L-shaped curve, which both represent longer duration recoveries, that's still more than half of survey respondents. So the outlook is, uh, is a little bit problematic and it's gonna be very important to monitor the success that state economies have in reopening and pulling the consumer out of their household and getting a snapback in that consumer spending category. Speaking of U-shaped recoveries, let's uh, switch our uh, conversation to what's going on with property valuations. The easiest place to see change in the valuation of commercial real estate property is in the REIT market. We all know that shares of REITs change value day to day, even minute to minute. In the first 21 days of the stock market correction, the S&P 500 lost about 20% of its value, which is known as a bear market. In that same time period, REITs lost roughly 45% of their market value, more than doubling the decline seen in broader equities. And that was, frankly, a, a pretty scary time to be watching Bloomberg and CNBC. But since that time, market valuations have improved and they've really found a rhythm over the past 25 trading sessions or so. And they're trading at about a 30% discount to the highs that were reported in uh, early uh, and mid-February. Unfortunately, this doesn't really look like a V-shaped recovery. The good news is not that much time has passed yet, and we may see some of these uh, valuations start to recover. But frankly, recovery is gonna be pretty uneven from a property type perspective. When we break down this price performance by property type, we see that there's really only two categories that have performed well, and the majority of categories have performed below average. So thinking about valuations at the end of the year, we can look at REIT price to net asset value ratios. What I mean by that is, what's the value of the REIT in the, on the stock exchange relative to the value of the assets that it owns on its balance sheet? It's not that surprising to see that data centers and industrial properties have performed pretty well. Data centers are actually more valuable than they were at the end of the year, ostensibly because everybody is uh, working remotely and conducting meetings like this one online, and data centers are benefiting from higher capacity utilization and increased demand for cloud computing storage. Logistics centers, while they've experienced a decline, uh, some of them uh, are in very big demand from logistics companies that are trying to get goods uh, through uh, e-commerce distribution channels into American households. But still, the REITs have experienced some decline in valuation at the corporate level. 
To the right-hand side of the overall bar, we see some very divergent performance with healthcare and residential each experiencing a decline in relative valuations, but nothing like what's being seen in the lodging and uh, retail space. Obviously, malls are the worst off. Um, and what we, ex what we would expect is that private real estate valuations will somehow mimic this type of pricing performance, but it remains to be seen the level of dim diminution of value that we're going to see in the private real estate markets. Speaking of private real estate, uh, the best measure for valuations is a index that's co-authored by Real Capital Analytics and Moody's Analytics, the Commercial Property Price Index. What they appear to be suggesting is that we, we are going to see a roughly 20 to 25 percent decline in private real estate valuations, really bottoming in late 20 uh, or the first quarter of 21 and needing the better part of two years to recover back to pre-pandemic valuations. Again, I want to point out that price uh, performance by property type is going to be uh, very variable and it's very difficult to predict by property type uh, what's going to happen. As you might expect, the markets that had a lot of momentum going into the downturn are probably going to sustain that momentum and will outperform. We're going to touch on that as we get into some property type uh, uh, considerations, which I'll begin in retail. I mentioned that we're paying attention to a lot of different data sets. One of the most exciting ones to emerge during the pandemic is uh, Google, Google's providing mobility data that gives us a sense for the change in foot traffic within certain business segments relative to a baseline that was established pre-pandemic. This is a look at Google data on grocery visits. And what we see here is that in mid to late March, we saw a lot of people visiting grocery stores and stocking up, planning to stay home for a long time. In that time period, a lot of real estate investors were supposing that grocery anchored retail centers were going to be net beneficiaries of the pandemic. But unfortunately, mobility data tells us that we're still below baseline in terms of visits to those grocery uh, tenants. And this may be driven by an increasing dependence or willingness to utilize e-commerce for grocery sales and deliveries. And what's also interesting to see is that some of the states that are trying very hard to reopen are the ones that are seeing a recovery in foot traffic in these locations uh, at this point, whereas other markets that are not as quick to uh, reopen their economies, of course, are experiencing less foot traffic. So we'll be following this data going forward. But this is just one segment of the market. And frankly, it's the, one of the retail segments that is performing well. Let's look at retail sales by category. On the left-hand side, we've uh, bifurcated the data into what we just call the food categories, restaurants and bars, and grocery and liquor stores. The blue bar here represents total sales in February, and what you see is that these two categories had very similar sales levels in February, but what's happened since then has been extremely divergent. Not to the surprise of anybody that's listening in on the call, sales in restaurants and bars in March and, a in, uh, March and April declined by about 50% relative to the February baseline, whereas sales in grocery stores and liquor stores increased by 10%. In March, this growth rate was higher for grocery and liquor stores. It's since declined, and that may be because shoppers are less likely to be going to the grocery store as often as they were pre-pandemic. In the vehicle uh, category, obviously people are very hesitant to make big ticket purchases, and so vehicle sales, which is the largest retail category that's reported uh, by the Department of Commerce and the Census Bureau, has seen a very dramatic decline in overall sales. Just last week, I was uh, watching the Michael Jordan documentary on ESPN, and I saw a commercial from GM Finance that offered me an 84-month note at 0% APR financing if I was willing to buy a pickup truck for $10,000 off of MSRP. That's very emblematic of what we're seeing in the vehicle uh, department these days. And with people commuting less and uh, taking fewer road trips, we're seeing gas station sales decline also. Then there are all the other retail categories, and we've ordered them in terms of uh, magnitude. These four on the left-hand side are the largest, and therefore we consider them to be the most essential, since that's where a lot of money is spent by the American consumer. And the five categories at the, at the right are considered non-essential. Therefore, it's not that surprising to see that in the essential categories, the declines have been more nominal 
than they've been in the non-essential categories where we've seen very precipitous declines in consumer willingness to spend money. Also similar to vehicles, uh, we've seen furnishings and electronic sales decline very dramatically. Those are some big ticket items from time to time. The only segment of the retail market that is growing like grocery is e-commerce. And what we have seen is a very drastic acceleration of sales in that category. Indexing uh, retail sales between uh, e-commerce and retail sales outside of e-commerce, what we see is that since 2009, e-commerce sales have grown by 3x, and that is gonna provide a big boost in demand for industrial space. What we've also seen is that broader retail sales grew by about 50%, so that's 0.5x, but have since lost almost all of that growth in just a few short months. And when we think about demand for industrial space, we think of it coming in a couple different ways. Number one, as I've just said, demand for e-commerce logistics space is going to grow as a result of this pandemic, and it won't be transient. We also see an increase in demand for warehouse or manufacturing facilities uh, that offer light manufacturing capacity for those types of companies that want to bring more of their manufacturing onshore or nearshore. <clears throat> Unfortunately, a very significant part of the existing warehouse market supports brick and mortar retailers. And as we've seen sales decline, many of the uh, businesses that lease space in industrial properties that support those brick and mortar sales are going to be undermined. So as we think about what markets may uh, experience uh, momentum of growth versus what markets may experience uh, deterioration in, in tenant demand. We think about how much availability was in existence in the first quarter and what the momentum was in terms of tenant demand for that availability leading into the downturn. Said another way, Inland Empire has a lot of vacant square footage uh, available uh, as of March 31, 2020. They had 50 million square feet of available vacant space. However, over the previous 12 months, the Inland Empire had absorbed roughly 60% of the availability in the market. That's a very different scenario than what plays out in some of the other uh, major industrial markets around the country, such as my native Houston, Texas, or a market like Chicago, which has frankly a very high level of available square footage and therefore hasn't been able to lease quite as big a percentage of that available square footage. The markets over here to the left-hand side of the page seem like they're gonna have an easier time maintaining uh, healthy property fundamentals and maybe even pushing rental rates. Some of these markets surely will be able to push rental rates if they um, have properties that have attractive availability for tenants that need space, but their ability to push rents more dramatically may be undermined as you get further to the right. Thinking about overall uh, shifts in property fundamentals as a result of the pandemic, what we see here uh, in the very lightly shaded bars is uh, a, a company like CoStar, when they're forecasting property fundamentals, would have expected a heavier amount of speculative development deliveries in 2021, and has since revised their forecast downward to expect a lower amount of deliveries in about a year. In the interim, they also expect some demand destruction, maybe coming from a decline demand for whole, wholesale warehousing, uh, supporting brick and mortar retailers. And that's gonna result in higher vacancy in the near term. But over the long term, vacancy is gonna normalize and get very close to pre-pandemic lows and remain in the mid single digits. So the industrial market, while experiencing some short-term pain, it normalize and resume its expansionary healthy market fundamentals uh, in pretty short order. From here, we're gonna switch gears and talk about apartments. A lot of the conversation in apartments has revolved around rent collections, and there were some pretty draconian expectations for rent uh, collections in late March. Fortunately, uh, across the country, rent collections haven't deteriorated all that much. And as of May 13th, rent collections were actually better across the country than they were on April 13th. Not by much, but it was an improvement. And while many of the MSAs uh, on the right-hand side, when we, when we take a tighter geographic focus, many of the MSAs are reporting above national average collection rates. But what's interesting to think about is the collection rate relative to the same period last year. So over here, we have markets that have experienced 
a relatively small decline in collections. And some of the markets here are surprising. Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Sacramento, and Cincinnati, all above national average and not experiencing a bigger reported drop in rental rate collections. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have some markets that are experiencing a little bit more volatility and in some cases are well below national averages. It's not all that surprising to see a market like Las Vegas or Los Angeles uh, relatively uh, low in terms of collections relative to this time last year, given uh, how either widespread job losses have been in a market like Las Vegas or um, how restrictive movement is and the ability of a renter to uh, cover their payment given that it's a high cost of living market and maybe they're not replacing 100% of their disposable income as a result of uh, getting a, uh, losing a job that is. What's also interesting to look at is what may happen with the migration of uh, the American population. One interesting uh, set of analysis that we found uh, in a CoStar presentation, again, giving some props to that company, is the idea that when you're living in a market and you want to move, you typically get online and you look for available apartments in the area of town in which you want to live. Conversely, um, if you are in a market and you want to stay, you're looking for a vacancy in market. So this is a, uh, a graph that measures that. The vertical axis here suggests that a market like Austin has seen a 30% rise in people looking to move into Austin from somewhere else and a 70% decrease in the number of people that live in Austin looking to move somewhere else. So what's interesting here is we have technology and life science markets that are really benefiting from what looks like some increasing demand from out of market. Conversely, on the lower right-hand side of the graph, we see some gaming and manufacturing markets that look like they're gonna see an increase in the number of people that may be looking to leave. This has some uh, pretty obvious implications for landlords' ability to maintain occupancy and maintain and drive rent growth going forward. Switching gears to the office market, a lot of the conversation has revolved around uh, concentrations to, to certain tenant types in a given industry. Thinking about hospitality and gaming, really very important to the underlying economies of Orlando and Las Vegas. But in terms of office space use, usage, it's relatively small. With those categories, call it, we call them hospitality, accounting for less than 4% of the existing market. Conversely, energy is very highly concentrated in a few markets like Houston and Oklahoma City. And so we are expecting that the drop off in demand in the energy market is going to be more, more of a detractor from asset performance in energy driven markets than it's gonna be in hospitality driven markets. And we see a very, very high concentration of the majority of the gateway and quote unquote non-major office markets uh, around the country here on the bottom left hand side of the screen. The question here is really going to be about space utilization and what's going to be the quote unquote new normal as tenants come back into their building and operate within their space in new ways. <clears throat> Thinking about property fundamentals in the office market, a good canary in the uh, coal mine would be changes to sublet availability. And this is an area where Houston uh, can provide a lot of uh, a lot of guidance to how landlords may behave going forward. This is some analysis that was put together um, by the uh, Transwestern research team, and it essentially asks how many square feet of sublet availability exists in the market. And what has been the change in that sublet availability over the past year? Markets on the left hand side obviously have more sublet availability than the markets to the right. But any market that has a orange triangle that's kind of rising vertically up the scale means that they're starting to experience a high increase in the amount of sublet availability that's going to be competing with direct vacancy that landlords are marketing. This could be a pretty predictive indicator of property fundamentals going forward. And so we're going to continue to pay attention to that type of metric. Overall, we see uh, in terms of forecasting some similarities to the industrial market. Short-term pain in terms of tenant consolidation within existing buildings, but a decline in the amount of deliveries of speculative office development in the out years. What this results in is a higher vacancy rate in 2020 and 2021 than was previously anticipated, but as a result of fewer deliveries, CoStar actually sees the nationwide vacancy rate being better off in 
2023, 24, and 25 than they had previously forecasted. So short-term pain, long-term gain, uh, gain may, be, uh, may be the story. I'd like to leave you with a look at uh, construction disruption because it's so important to the forecast that CoStar is, uh, is uh, demonstrating in this presentation. And it also has a big impact on property fundamentals before I hand it over to Steve Pumper to handle uh, capital markets and we move into Q&A. The National Multifamily Housing Council has conducted two surveys of its members, uh, one in March and another in April, and we found some interesting themes in the data. Overall, about 56% of developers report experiencing uh, delays in their ongoing construction projects. And of that 56 that were reporting construction delays, 77% of them are attributable to permitting. And um, I hope there are no uh, city council members on the phone today, and I apologize if you are, but we all know that's, that uh, city planning and uh, permitting departments are notoriously slow. So it stands to reason that they'd be even slower when they're all working from home. To a lesser degree, uh, companies uh, have needed to delay starting their projects, uh, and, but it's still you know, easily more than half of, uh, half of projects that are reporting a delay are suffering from that. And a relatively small amount of markets are experiencing a unilateral moratorium on construction development, although we're starting to see those uh, get alleviated very rapidly uh, and in many markets even that have some strict reopening uh, rules being rolled out. In terms of uh, labor and materials, really we've seen in the survey results that labor and availability of labor is a bigger problem than global supply chains that are bringing materials to site and the cost of materials looks like it's not uh, very much a concern. How construction companies and developers are adapting is overwhelmingly tied to technology and staggering labor shifts on the job site. So the more that we see disruption in uh, construction, uh, unfortunately, it's going to disrupt business plans and it's gonna disrupt our developer clients. But according to the forecast, that may end up being a good thing uh, in two to three years as it relates to rent growth and property fundamentals. Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you for capital markets. Thanks, Thanks Jimmy. Jimmy, I appreciate that. So on the transaction, so the transaction values, volume. obviously it's gonna go down, it's gonna decline, there's gonna be an issue there. We're all very well familiar with that. Um, you know, the volumes for the rest of the year are supposed to be down 50% year over year. There's just been a significant drop off in, in the amount of transactional volume as people are looking for price discovery. But there are a few things I'd like to bring up is that the private buyers are leading the way. They tend to be a little bit more entrepreneurial. They tend to be on the ground and have good fundamentals earlier on than some of the other investors that are willing to take on that, that extra risk. Um, and they're playing primarily in that opportunistic equation or in the debt side of the equation. And um, as a result of that, we're seeing some transactions uh, being done. You're, you're seeing a couple of strategies, and one is the best of the best, the core quality assets, as we've seen experience with Spear Street acquiring 225 West Wacker that just recently closed for um, 210 million. They acquired it from Murray. It's uh, 651,000 square feet, and the acquisition was 322 a foot. Now that price dropped five percent from the uh, pre-pandemic pricing. And so for Murray to still be able to close that with Spear Street with a 5% reduction based upon a 96% occupied building, that was, that was an actually a, a great um, execution on their behalf. Um, and I think Spear Street will end up doing well with the asset long-term. What we're normally seeing in the repricing of assets since the COVID-19 has kicked in, is typically in that 10 to 20% range. So as you kind of chart these values and volumes, I would say it is not unusual to see the values drop easily 10% and maybe as much as 20% from the peak pricing earlier this year, and the volume should drop off significantly given um, the pricing discovery and the debt that has kind of gone away for a while, and we'll address that in a little bit. Uh, let's go forward, Jimmy. So again, everybody on the institutional side is probably going to be pretty thoughtful how they're going to pursue things because on the institutional side, they're going to get their arms around 
their portfolio. They're going to try and get a feel for how it is um, operating going forward. They are so focused on right now on rent collection and expense reduction. They're looking at potentially cutting back a little bit in the janitorial and security side uh, of the equation. But right now they are so focused on pushing hard to get that rent collection in. And as a result of that, they're looking for more data metrics to understand where pricing is headed. So if you're talking initially that five to 10% on the core stabilized assets, the best of the best, and then on the rest of the assets in the core plus and the value add, a drop in that 10 to as much as 20%, they're gonna take their time to get there. So with, with the buyer pools thinning, the debt has also kind of slowed a little bit. And as a result, um, you know, if you look at the banks, they've been dealing with regulators and they've been trying to get their arms around their portfolio. And they've also been dealing with their prime clients. So for them to be able to get the debt out, they need to um, make sure that they're keeping the regulators happy. They're up to speed with uh, the new government programs. And again, accommodating the prime clients. Having said that, we've started to see the banks come back into the market recently, which is a good thing. On the life codes on the debt side, which impacts the bidder pools. Um, you know, again, they're getting their arms around their assets, managing their portfolio, focused on price discovery, and again, lending on only the best of the best. And I'd say they may be uh, the least active of the uh, of the lenders who are in the marketplace. And obviously, CMBS right now has been locked up. You're starting to see a few quotes coming out, but there hasn't been much movement in that and I see that continuing for a while. Uh, the debt funds are dealing with margin calls and have been um, uh, out of the loop as well. The agencies are still active. The process is taking longer. The, the pricing initially moved up. Now it's come back in a little bit. So given that and the propensity for the private buyers to be active, the multifamily sector is doing actually pretty well under the circumstances. So I think the buyer pool is again focused on getting their arms around trends that will allow them to see where the data points are headed over the next 30, 90, 180 days, while some of the more opportunistic investors are focused on going in there, buying by the pound, and um, also looking at a debt play. Uh, next slide, please. Fear of transaction to higher cap rates. I, th I think that's I think that's a fair statement. So, you know, obviously when the debt isn't accommodating, even though it's low, there aren't many people playing in that space. And while a lot of the equity players have gone to the sideline and they're trying to deal with their portfolios and see what the impact has been, the deals that are transacting now are getting bumped up on cap rates. Having said that, there are a few uh, private buyers who have been active. We talked about Spear Street, and there's a group, Omninet, who is based in Beverly Hill, that's been fairly active recently in the office sector in Southern Cal. They are huge deals. I'd call them mid-cap deals. So they recently, for $39 million, acquired a 204,000 square foot building in Torrance, California from TA Associates. And then they followed that up by buying a $32 million uh, office building for 195,000 square feet in commerce from Colony Capital. All those two have closed. And then they've got a third deal from a private seller under contract in Long Beach. It's a smaller deal, 15 million, 78,000 square feet. So again, they're looking at getting their third deal done in their environment. And, and I think what they're realizing is uh, less uh, competition, allowing them to buy assets that uh, they would have paid 100 to 150 basis points lower for as little as 60 days ago. Now they're getting a, uh, a nice price and they're hitting their numbers and being able to hit the returns for their investors. An interesting deal, uh, I think, is um, it's not closed yet, but Angelo Gordon and Madison Capital have tied up 123 Mission in San Francisco. Many of you will know that as the Jewel Building. And Jewel actually had acquired the building uh, years ago and um, has decided to relocate from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., had the property on the market and pre-COVID, it was supposedly ready to trade at $1,200 per foot, but now Angelo Gordon and Madison Capital have stepped in 
and they're um, reportedly under contract at $800 per square foot. It's 346,000 square foot building, so that purchase price would be 277 million. And then obviously, you know, they're getting a third reduction as to what um, the prior buyer had it under contract for. So obviously, huge impact on cap rates when you've got a shallow buyer pool coupled with a shallow uh, uh, debt capability. Uh, next slide, please. Debt market, we talked about how they've been playing. Um, and, and again, you've got uh, the, you know, you've got the insurance companies who've always had the best of the best. They're typically 50 to 60 billion in the market. They've been in there. CMBS has long been very active in secondary and tertiary markets, as well as the retail sector. So with them being quiet at this point in time, the secondary and tertiary markets are being heavily impacted, as well as the retail space, which is also under the fu under fire for, you know, obviously poor fundamentals with uh, all the closings and shutdowns of the malls and the in the restaurants and, and several of the tenants within that particular space. In fact, I just run a, a little deal um, just on forbearance requests in April, and I did that locally here in Dallas. And there were uh, forbearance requests in the retail sector on the mall side was 90% in April. For power centers, it was 65%. For community centers, it was 27%. And for the best of the best neighborhood centers, was even a high water mark of 18%. So we're wishing everybody in the retail sector the best as they start to reopen around the country, but there's a, a tough slog ahead of time. Uh, again, the agencies have been very active and uh, the banks are working with their, their preferred clients. So I think it's gonna be choppy for the remainder of the year. I see a number of, uh, you know, private buyers taking the deal down and then applying debt on their fund if they've got that. And then, then the opportunistic sector really focused on hotels, malls uh, in the BNC sector and senior housing initially. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Dry powder ready to recap. I think this is just huge. I mean, there's so much going out there. There is so much capital that has been raised to be put to work in this particular sector. So you've got a number of things going on. One interesting factor before I jump into this is that Opportunity, opportunity Zones um, started to see a sell off from the stock market in December into January into February. And those high net worth uh, individuals, that money started flowing into um, the Opportunity Zone, just to kind of a minimize on the capital gains, a steady cash flow, and uh, just a a strong alternative for them. And we started to see that happen in February. We're continuing to see that a, a significant uh, influx of capital from high net worth investors into the opportunity zones. Now, if you get back into the recap, this capital that has been raised to step into it, obviously opportunistic again, uh, is, is where the money wants to be. Um, they're, they're willing to step in, they buy by the pound. They feel that if they get in at the right price with a solid as, as asset with good um, fundamentals, they'll be able to justify doing well. I talked to one of our clients a few weeks ago who said in the uh, 08, 09 downturn, the deals that they didn't do and they missed out by five to 10 bucks a foot, they, uh, the re in, the, in the recovery, they kicked themselves for not doing it. They said they're gonna stretch early to play in that particular space. And I think that's gonna be a theme going forward. Um, the other thing I'd say within that, as, as owners look to get their recaps done from investors coming in to help them out, they've got to really make a decision. Most recap investors are going to want to come in and take a significant position and quite frankly control the process. So I think the people who are looking to recap, they've got to determine which strategy they want to utilize going forward. And, and as a result of that, if they want to re retain control and they've got good product and a sizable value, their most like, uh, likely partner in that particular one is a foreign investor who could come in at 49% and kind of be a passive investor and um, benefit from uh, the flight to uh, quality and the flight to safety here in the U.S. Um, and as a result, then uh, the, uh, the operating uh, investor uh, in the States would, would be able to still be in control. 
But if they're looking for a major influx of capital, they're really going to have to take a, 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 a position where they're willing to step back and deal with that investor going forward. So as a result of that, we're, we're seeing those start, uh, those discussions start to happen right now. But going forward, we think that that will be prevalent over the next 18 to 36 months, depending on the asset class and depending on the market that you're at. Um, a few other trends I'd say before we kick it to Q&A is just that we're seeing um, uh, a contrarian view in the suburban office market where investors are starting to kick tires on suburban office markets, but they want them heavily amenitized. And one of the things they see is um, we've seen some Manhattan uh, tenants start to look at northern New Jersey for office space because of the proximity to the commute and the de-densification going forward and the fact that they don't have to ride the trains into the city. So one of our other clients said, well, the suburban offices are already being used. It's called their homes. And anybody with young kids at home realizes that that's not a long-term solution. So I would tell you, I would rethink suburban office going forward. Uh, I think there will be opportunities, and I focus in on edge cities that are amenitized that will benefit from that going forward. Um, and then finally, we're also looking at the industries we think will be winners going forward, and that should go into every decision you're making in all the asset classes, um, whether it be office, industrial, uh, multifamily or retail, and we're focusing on the long-term industry winners, and we're seeing them in the digital tech side of the equation, in the lifestyle, in education, and then in the healthcare and life sciences. An interesting thing to note is year-to-date, the venture capital firms have put more money into life sciences to date uh, in 2020 than they did in all of 2019. So I'd say anything with a healthcare or life science bent would do well. And then the final thing in industrial logistics is a huge winner. And as a result of the 14% growth that had been uh, the experience of uh, e-commerce now headed to 20%, coupled with potentially onshoring some of the manufacturing that has been offshore, these two things could take the need for additional industrial space for another 800 million to a billion square feet of industrial distribution and manufacturing. So we're very bullish on that and feel very positive about that. So with that, Jimmy, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we're going to we're going to leave this page here on some conclusions. Uh, some of this content we've covered, but most of it we haven't just so that you all can take a look. Um, before we get into Q&A, I just want to say um, these slides are available to you. You're invited to the presentation and we want you to have a copy of the slides uh, if you want it. So please uh, extend a note to the person that invited you to the presentation and they can get you a copy of the slides properly. Um, one of the questions uh, that we got started um, with um, um, the idea of a difference in performance among A, B, and C apartments. Uh, and we're, we're still trying to track, you know, how this is playing out at the local level. Not all uh, markets are created equal. So making, making a broad statement nationally about asset performance by class is difficult. Um, but I'm going to make an attempt. What we believe is that the market is going to be surprised at the outperformance of C, uh, or rather B relative to A. Um, <clears throat> overwhelmingly, as you saw, the highest um, exposure to unemployment comes in in um, zip codes where the average reported income is less than $50,000. Um, to be candid, when you look at the, the composition of ownership of Class B apartments, uh, a lot of the reported incomes in the residents um, are not in that range. A lot of the households across America that, that have that type of income um, are not renters, uh, at least not of the traditional product that a lot of commercial real estate professional investors are buying. Um, and in terms of the in terms of household formation, there are a higher number of households forming at the lower income brackets. Um, given what's going on with with unemployment within the labor force and incomes. 
So the number of households that are forming at the higher end of the spectrum from an income standpoint, which is what is required to corroborate uh, a development budget, uh, will be forming certainly, but forming in decreasing number and as a decreasing portion of total household formation. When you combine um, those trends with the construction pipeline being overwhelmingly tilted towards a quality product, we believe that maybe not at the outset, but over time we're going to experience uh, more deterioration in property fundamentals in the A part of the space, especially in the, the urban A. <clears throat> um, so I, uh, I hope that answers that question. You know, if I had anything else to say, it would be um, you know, suburban uh, two bedroom uh, heavy apartment properties that uh, are of relatively new vintage and um, offer an opportunity for people that have been living in uh, one bedroom apartments and urban environments to pair up together uh, may be uh, experiencing or will experience going forward a lot of demand. Next question um, related to urban versus suburban, which uh, I think Steve handsomely covered uh, in his commentary on capital markets. Uh, there was one question about Houston and its ability to diversify its economy. Um, I'm in I'm in Houston, Texas, as I mentioned earlier in the call, and um, you know, frankly, Houston did a, is is very diverse relative to where it was in the 1980s. But it, as is, is obvious, energy is still an incredibly important uh, component of the underlying economy. And fortunately, uh, whereas energy was very heavily dominated by exploration in the 1980s, it has diversified into uh, other disciplines and, and business verticals within energy, such as midstream uh, and refinery. And with the amount of oil that is uh, being produced and shipped and refined, there is a significant part of the Houston economy that has performed very well, um, even though it's in energy. Uh, additionally, you know, the, the, the jobs that were lost in 2015 and 2016 in the exploration side of the business, uh, when uh, OPEC first decided not to cut production, which was around Thanksgiving 2014, those jobs that were lost in the wake of that decision were not added back to payrolls. So once a job has been lost, uh, you can't lose it again unless you get rehired. So um, while the outlook is definitely challenged for Houston and the economy is not quote unquote diversified like you would see in a market like Boston or um, or uh, a peer like Dallas uh, Fort Worth, it is more diversified relative to uh, previous shocks like this. It is going to be a challenged market, uh, however, going forward. Um, and then Steve, I think this is a great question for you to cover. It is, do you see lenders quickly modifying their position for uh, restructuring uh, loans on retail properties, given that that could be a pinch point uh, in the recovery? Well, th thank you for that. Um, right now, and I've talked to a number of lenders out there, you know, everybody is drinking water through a fire hose in that retail sector right now. So on the lending side, whether it's on the CMBS side or it, which, by the way, is a big lender in that particular space, or whether it's a bank or anybody else who's a lender who's having issues, they're treating it fairly similar to how the landlords are dealing with the tenants. So as a result of these things, they're sitting back and they're being thoughtful and they're trying to take a fair approach to it, but they are asking for backup. So if there is a chance to work with uh, somebody on a loan, they're going to require some financial information to kind of open the books. They can work through it together. And if it's a really sincere, thoughtful, worthwhile deal, they're going to step in. They're going to try and meet them and solve this process because right now it's like, you know, putting your finger in the dike. So many things are popping up. They're trying to deal with the people who are willing to work with them. For the other people who are just trying to take advantage of a, of a crisis and benefit from it, those people won't typically benefit from it. And what I would say, the final thing I'd say is that um, last time in the 08, 09 scenario, when I spoke with a lot of my friends in the lending community, if their borrowers would come to them or sit down with them and they'd come in and they'd negotiate and they'd put additional capital into the deal, they were much more um, willing to restructure and redo the loan that was mutually beneficial. So if you're willing to show a good faith effort, 
chances are your lenders are going to be open to that because they understand the times we're dealing in currently. OK, and the, the final question uh, relates to the balance between um, the unemployment claims filed and which which one of those are structural versus uh, which one are cyclical. And um, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit so that I can answer it instead of having to avoid answering it. I think a good way to think about this is how long can we expect temporary layoffs to remain temporary? And I'm going to borrow um, some analysis by the Brookings Institute and say that the, the economic policy response to COVID-19 um, should and has been purposely designed to maximize the share of workers who are able to return to their previous employer um, as employers are um, reallocating payroll expense to federal and state programs and subsidizing employers who can retain or rehire those workers um, benefiting from a generous unemployment benefit that keeps them in the labor market um, is what is going to allow these temporary layoffs to remain that way. Um, we should also keep in mind that you know temporary layoffs are, are typically limited in duration. In the, uh, in the great financial crisis, people who uh, filed an unemployment claim, um, everybody that does that is asked, are you on a temporary uh, layoff or a permanent layoff? And roughly uh, the average amount of time that someone was quote on layoff was about four weeks. So that is an interesting uh, threshold to be looking at as we start to look at continuing unemployment claims. Um, and we all have a very important date in mind and that's when the PP program expires at the end of July and we'll be looking at unemployment claims uh, on a continuing basis by state level in our next presentation. So. With two minutes left in the hour, I think we will wrap it up. Thank you for attending. Please reach out to uh, your professional advisor at Transwestern for a copy of the slides if you want them. Kim, back to you. Thanks, Jimmy. And thank you for joining us for this week's Transwestern Talks. Watch for an invitation coming soon for our next talk. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.